And what did you do with all of this insight and information about audiences in the new organisation? Well, I think I'd like to say two things at, at the head of that. I mean, th this work was very important in terms of the setup and the shape of Sound and Music as it was established. For, for the one thing, it, it was clear that we needed a, a significant marketing department in order to be able to take this work forward. And that led to us actually having quite a heavy and quite senior marketing solution for Sound and Music, which to me felt like the right thing to do, rather than to attempt to outsource marketing in any way. Um, I also think it was key in the establishment of Sound and Music at all, and in its identity, because without the... It was one of the one of the more unique parts of the offer that Sound of Music could offer, was bringing together as much information as we could gather on audiences, and trying to make that helpful and useful for the sector as a whole. Um, so I'm not sure that Sound of Music would have been established in the form that it was, but for the audience development work that was done. Having said that, the application of the work within Sound of Music became quite problematic. Um, I think there were a lot of that was to do with internal reasons within Sound and Music. One of those was the amount that the organisation had to do to simply establish itself as an organisation. Part of it I think also had to do with a couple of elements of what I might call producer culture, in that um, my finding is that a lot of people that actually work at the sharp end of putting programmes on within arts organisations are quite suspicious of audience development and often quite suspicious of marketing unless they can control it themselves. Um, I thought initially this might be unique to sound and music until I sat in a, a workshop which was actually facilitated by Audiences London uh, next to the, a marketing person from Tate, from, um, uh, from Tate Modern who described exactly the same scenario, that in her view she had 29 producers all doing the same sort of thing on niche products which she struggled to market, to which the audience development relationship wasn't clear, and if she had anything to do with it, the whole programme ring of Tate Modern, which we might think of as one of the most successful marketing exercises of modern times, would look completely different. So there is this tension between organisations, particularly at the edgier end of work, between um, acceptance of marketing and the need for audience development. Other issues that we found, um, one was that it is one thing to come up with a kind of concept of what your audience might look like and have a nice label on it called countercultural mix or you know urban adventurer or something. It's another to be able to internalize that and really have a clear understanding of who these people are in practice. We had one member of our team who'd worked in this kind of way with audience development before um, at an organisation called Arts Depot, I think it was, and she said that the way they made it concrete for themselves was to simply put up pictures of people they thought or they knew from their audience to be this kind of person and it was only by that kind of visualisation technique and then kind of getting behind that that they really were able to work with the material and the rich data that they had produced. Um, but working at the edgier end of work again, as we most frequently did, one of the th and working with partners, one of the things that we particularly struggled to track was actually to be able to bring the next layer of data in, if you like, to get um, producers, to get um, venues to share with us really any data about their own audience. It was becoming clear that we were going to have to build up our own data set if we were actually going to make much progress on this. And certainly at the point where I left Sound and Music, this was very much what the um, marketing department were looking to do, and also to work with um, more sympathetic organisations within the sector, like London Sinfonietta, for example, to build further on the picture from the primary users of who these people were, what they were using us for, what kind of events might they look at, how could we present things in a different way to attract them in greater numbers. So the work was important in establishing Sound and Music as an entity at all, um, and the application of it was, I think, quite problematic, but to me that didn't validate the importance of the work, quite the contrary. 
and indeed if you were to look down the kind of checklist of things which Audience London gave us of what an audience focused organisation must look like to succeed uh, you can check out the ones that were not followed and you could actually uh, build quite a good case for why the organisation has some of the issues that it does today. So I, I think the work was actually extremely valid and stands up very well as a kind of, um, both as research in itself and uh, as a measure by which to look at the organisation or organisations more generally.